Hey, I'm your Santa for the day. Uh, my name's Tim. I'm going to take off these sunglasses because it, it is night where I am uh, and I cannot really see much. But ho, 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 welcome. Thank you. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, in our software circus, Winter Wonderland, our final meetup of the year. Uh, as I said, my name is Tim. I'm a senior cloud native engineer at Container Solutions. And today I'm being helped by my elves, Tomash and Teresa. Uh, so as we go through, I'll go through the agenda today. So uh, we'll have a bit of housekeeping and announcements. Uh, we'll then introduce Carlos, who will talk about Knative and serverless all the things. Thank you, Carlos. We'll have a small Q&A afterwards. Uh, our second talk of the day will come from Vuyo, who's going to talk about learning terror forms uh, using GCP. Uh, again, we'll have a short Q&A at the end. And finally, our wrap up. So housekeeping. Uh, as with every uh, software circus, we do have a code of conduct. And again, my uh, lovely elf will post a link in the chat. Uh, you can also scan the QR code. Uh, in essence, don't 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 be an asshole. Uh, if, but do read it. It is open source. We you please use it if you do um, uh, create any meetups, conferences. You can use the code of conduct uh, we provide, and and we do advise you to to do that. We think that every meetup or conference should have its code of conduct. Uh, second announcement, we are recording this session and we do post it on our YouTube channel. You can uh, go on our YouTube channel to look at previous sessions of meetups and previous conferences going back years and years as well. Uh, uh, and we also have a newsletter, a uh, WTF uh, newsletter. Do subscribe. We do not bother you. You can decide how many uh, uh, sub newsletters you get per week about what. You can easily unsubscribe. We do not want to spam you, but it is a big source of information um, and, and, and you can learn quite a lot from it. So please do subscribe to our newsletter. Um, and you've got the links. Uh, again, my friendly elf is uh, posting the links in the chat. And also there's a QR code for anybody who's watching this at a later stage. Uh, now, um, I'm going to ask my other elf, Lavinia, to come in and uh, go over this slide. Lavinia? Yes, thank you. So uh, just uh, some information if you're interested to join us at some point. Maybe not now, maybe later, uh, maybe next year. We have what we call an inventory role. It's a cloud native engineer inventory role. So it uh, helps us uh, keep, you know, people who are interested, uh, keep them um, process their applications and keep them um, on hold in case uh, they want to join for the time when we are able to make an offer and expand the team. Um, the other role that we have open, um, which uh, is active right now, it's a software engineer role within uh, our daughter company called Engineer Better. Um, and this role is mostly focused on development, uh, but it's a hybrid again, it has some infrastructure uh, in it. So it's mostly based on Python, Golang, and some gluing tools. CICD, Terraform, um, all of those things. So if you're interested, uh, please check them out. You can uh, use this, uh, this slide to go directly to the job ads, or you can use the links to apply. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Lavinia. Um, that'd be a great Christmas present for you if you do apply and get the job. I mean, that's a Christmas. What a new year would that be? Uh, okay, so as we said, we've got two great speakers, uh, Carlos Santana uh, from IBM and Vuyo, 
I'm not going to even dare. I know I get it wrong every time I say it. I do apologize, Vuyo. Uh, but Vuyo is, is, is a cloud native engineer with Container Solutions, and I'm really looking forward. I've had a sneak preview of the slides, and I'm really looking forward uh, to hearing her talk. But first, Carlos, um, do you want to take over the screen? I'll stop sharing. Um, and while you do that, I'll introduce you. So Carlos is a cloud architect with IBM. Um, he's also uh, been recently appointed to the steering committee of Knative. And uh, Carlos will talk to us, in fact, about Knative and serverless all things. Hello, Carlos. You're muted. Double muted. Yeah, there you go. We can hear you now. Uh, double muted, as always. Um, OK. Thanks. Um, so I thanks for the invitation. Uh, I got uh, the mail uh, from the North Pole to wear attired. So I told my wife, um, get the August sweater out there and she bought the nicest one. So uh, that's like the translation. Um, I'm here in the North Pole and I'm ready to, to present. Um, glad to be here. I have a couple of slides. Um, but I want to be, keep it uh, very um, informal. Feel free to ask questions. Um, and we're just going to have fun learning, learning something new that may you not be aware. Um, so uh, like it was mentioned, you see my slides? Yep, we do. Yep. So I'm going to, to take uh, the session of, of, of Knative, a little bit about me. Um, uh, first of all, I'm a dad and husband. Um, if I make a, a good job at that, any, anything else doesn't matter. Um, I also work for IBM for the last 20 years. Um, I'm a senior principal engineer um, for IBM uh, cloud and uh, hybrid. I'm concentrating lately in cloud native assets and architectures to help customers uh, bring their workloads, modernize them, and run them in in Kubernetes, and and the the the, the downstream that um, that we use is OpenShift. As everybody knows, uh, we acquired OpenShift uh, some time ago, and um, we are trying to help customers run OpenShift everywhere from VMware, AWS, GCP, um, and running in production is very hard. Um, and uh, I know Sevi from from running a, a weekly uh, Friday book club. And we, I think it took a, several months uh, talking about what it yeah, takes to we run. We started in April, yeah. Yeah, I was looking for, for some of the, the stats. Um, so this week is the last week, chapter 16. It's a great book. It uh, talks about running Kubernetes in production, but we got together every week and uh, some SMEs and some people that just wanted to know like what Kubernetes is and talk about our stories around what it takes to run in, in production um, with all versions of Kubernetes. So surprise, surprise, no one runs the latest version of Kubernetes. That's the first one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and in open source and community, I like to do those type of things at like the book club. I've been involved with open source for many years, for the last 10 years, um, mostly for Apache, Apache Foundation. Um, I did, um, I was a committer for a um, mobile application framework called Cordova, then later move into serverless. I did a, I'm a co-creator of OpenWhisk. It's a functions as a service open source project and an IBM service. And then took my learnings there and, and moved to, to Knative, the open source project uh, that we also use in IBM and OpenShift and many customers and, and, and vendors. So, so that's the topic that we're talking today. Um, so I've been involved with Knative since 2018. Um, this year was the elections for steering committee. Uh, we have a governing model where we have steering, uh, TOC, technical oversight committee, and then trademark. Um, and I decided to run for steering uh, to see if we can uh, grow the community and enhance Kubernetes. At the end of the day, Knative is a plugin or extension to enhance uh, the Kubernetes user experience. Um, so I'm also the, the lead for the user experience and docs lead there. Um, that's my info. You can follow me on Twitter. I try to be very active. Um, started a, 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 a newsletter, weekly newsletter. So if you want to sign up, 
uh, you can sign up. I also have a, a newsletter. It's mostly cloud native and the things that I find interesting uh, for the week. I didn't know I was going to have like content, but um, every week there's something new. So uh, happy people can join. You can find me online and my DMs, DMs are open. And also in that website, um, you can find a candidate. So if you want to have coffee on Friday or something, book, book some time and we'll have coffee and we can talk about anything. So that's, that's my intro. Um, and I was also told that I needed to bring something fun. Um, I tried to dress. So this is a, a family recipe. Um, only for the next 10 seconds, you will see this here. This is my mom's recipe. She doesn't know that I'm giving it away. But um, yeah, whoever is watching this I got 10 it. seconds I got it. Um, I got will it. have it. So this is like the Puerto Rican version of the eggnog. Um, you have, you put uh, evaporated milk, coconut, more coconut, El yolk, cinnamon, vanilla, and then one cup of rum as minimum. You can put more. That's, that's up to you. And then uh, take it um, very cold. Uh, so that's my mom's recipe. There's many versions of the recipe, but this is the one in our house and our family that, that we love and we do. So that's my mom's family. Um, so let's get started on, on serverless um, and, uh, and Knative. So these are kind of the uh, attributes that we have in Knative. The serverless, uh, we, I, I tried, I won't go to see this year, but we, we put a, st a spin into it. Uh, most likely the serverless piece of it is kind of marketing um, or kind of like summarized thing in one word. It's very difficult to define serverless these days. But the, the idea of behind Knative is to make um, Kubernetes better or people doing building cloud native or building a service um, that is container-based. So we have, we have adopted containers for the for the last years and i think everybody's comfortable saying yes we we know what containers are they're good let's use them um and some people in their journey they are in the packaging phase uh like i heard this week where there are packaging in containers and that's a good first step and then there's others orchestrating um and working with the schedule of maximizing that those containers um um, in the cloud or hybrid cloud. So the first thing, um, and I will do a demo on that is a simple abstractions. I, I don't like to start with a scale to zero uh, because it's, it's a powerful feature, uh, but it's not the only feature in Knative. I think the, the simplification of the abstraction on top of Kubernetes and providing a, a resource that um, if you have used Kubernetes for a while, you will feel that some things are repetitive um, unless you're packaging things in Helm and right, abstracting it into like a one-liner. But when you're working with Kubernetes uh, CRDs and custom resources, Kubernetes, by bringing CRDs, uh, gave our ability to extend Kubernetes, right? For people to explore and innovate on top of it, to find their use cases and see how they can extend it. Um, so there's a population of folks, very small of it, right? That can write Go code, can write CRDs and controllers. And there's another population that are not interested in that part. They're interested in like using those, those APIs. The other one is auto-scaling uh, Kubernetes. If you have worked with Kubernetes, um, auto-scaling has different many dimensions um, of how do you want to scale up, scale out. Um, so there's vertical scaling, there's horizontal auto scaling. Uh, Kubernetes, Knative is around stateless containers, uh, containers that can, we can spin them up very fast. We can spin a lot of them and then we can spin them down. So it's a, it's a way of managing that compute in a way that you're not attached to, for example, uh, storage or state. state. Um, and scaling to zero is a, a methodology where you can put more applications um, into the cluster uh, without sacrificing the, the resource allocations. So one example that I try to give like uh, people that are getting started or people in high school that I talk to is everybody has a, a, a smartphone, well, Google or uh, iPhone. So imagine um, right now you have a ton of apps in, in, your, in your phone, but those apps are not running. Some of them are like, they have a, a sticker in your screen but actually they're like removed. They don't have states um, and they're not running. They're not using CPU. 
and you have screens and screens and screens. If you're like me, I have apps for, for many years and I didn't bother to delete them. And, and there's apps that are like resident that they have state. And then there's apps, those apps, when you start stop using them, they will, they will stop consuming CPU. So that's the same story we, have, we want to have with auto scaling. We want to be able to define all these applications and different versions of the application, not just one version in your phone or cluster, and then decide which version of the application you want to run, the new one, the previous one, you want to run both at the same time with percentage and traffic splitting, or you just want to scale to them to zero because you want to put another application when you're, you know, while you're running, there's some applications where you're, during the night, there's another application. So at different, different times, the different applications running. The other one is, um, um, let me see here. I was, I forgot, uh, progressive rollout. I think I talked a little bit about that. Uh, rolling out different versions um, of, of, the, of your application. So um, there might not be applicable to you, but a lot of companies are, are very, they have a massive amount of users and they have different regions and they have to progressive roll out that, that version and check that is, that is okay and healthy. And it's get, they cannot take, if they're using that scale to zero and bring it back up, you have to like roll them out um, during a period of time. You cannot just switch, switch gears rapidly because you don't have enough pods to take all that workload that is coming. So uh, we have a, a, a way of, of that traffic management and also a, a one feature that, um, that we added as a starting point and, and pluggable, we'll talk about pluggable, that you can say uh, for the next hour, right? Uh, maybe you, you, you're you getting 10 requests per second, 10,000 10, requests per second, something like that. For the next hour, can the system please start rolling out from V1 to V2 and just divide the time the 100%. So it would, at the end of the hour, you will get there. So you can have that feature in, in Knative. The other side of the house is eventing. I'll show. Eventing in a second um, is um, the ability to take events uh, from anywhere. We integrate with Cloud Events. It's a CNCF project that specify um, a standard specification. They have SDKs where you have consumers and producers of these events. And Knative is like a reference implementation of, uh, of a system that can handle those events, that can traffic those events, filter those events, um, an event could be something simple like uploading a file to an object store and triggering a, a function and handling that, that event. Um, and the last thing that I said, uh, pluggable. So we are, we're plugging into Kubernetes, but in Knative, we left certain things um, to be pluggable. So because uh, the, the open source project, the same way as Kubernetes, we cannot come with all the batteries included it can come with a few and then you put your own, your own battery because you, maybe you need something else. Um, and a lot of people ask this, Knative is kind of divided into projects. It is, is serving and eventing. Serving is the one that deals with HTTP traffic. Uh, we also support other uh, protocols, um, HTTP2, GRPC, socket, um, web sockets, um, and this ability to, to serve traffic, that HTTP traffic. And a, and a totally separate component, which you can install serving or eventing. You don't have, they both don't depend um, now. Uh, they used to, but now you can install one or the other. And you have eventing where you have your source of events, right? That you can say, this is async or event-driven applications where events are flowing through the system. You subscribe to events, and then you run your business logic with those events. Um, and then the, the broker is the one that um, is the, the data plane, right? They, they, takes care of um, handling the, the events and sending it to the trigger. So the correlation there between eventing and serving is like um, a trigger could be a URL, it could be a, a service, just a regular Kubernetes service in your, your container, or it could be a URL outside the cluster, um, or it could be a URL inside the cluster, which could might be the serving, which is scaled to zero. So we'll scale it up, handle the event, and then it'll scale to zero. So that's one way of a, a pattern uh, between those two, but um, 
we 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 made them possible that you if you're interested in, in eventing you can use it by itself if you're interested in serving you can use it by itself and some of the cloud providers um uh, for example ibm provides the the serving part um and we added uh one for cloud just storage uh but mostly it's the the serving part where you have a container you give it to the cloud and you get back a url and and that's that's the basic of of um, making the, the usability better on in terms of if you have a container, just give it to the system and the system will handle everything, uh, most likely, most everything for you. And then this is um, some of the announcements. Um, we went 1.0, so we, the project started in 2018, started in Google, uh, got, got an open source in GitHub in 2018. Uh, some other uh, vendors got invited, Red Hat, IBM, SAP, VMware, and others And the community have been working on a 0.x release for the last uh, three, three, and a, three and a half years. Um, and the, the, uh, some parts of the, of the candidate have been in production. So it's production ready, but the 1.0, we didn't put it on it until we had an API uh, that we felt comfortable that we can did conformance. So if somebody wants to implement the candidate API, they don't have to use our code, but they can use whatever, the, like for example, uh, uh, Google, for example, uh, they can be using Borg, or they could be using something else, not necessarily Kubernetes, but they offer the candidate API through a SaaS service. The same thing for IBM Cloud, we have Code Engine. We offer that usability and those uh, APIs. So if you have a YAML, should be compatible if you run it here, you run it there, you run it on premise. Uh, that 1.0 is an API uh, work that we did. We sat down, um, I say we is a kind of the project, uh, not necessarily me, but we went sat down and saw like these IP APIs, uh, we really think uh, we don't go, we're not going to change them. Um, and it's 1.0 so people can start building system and they feel comfortable that we're not like the same, the same concept of um, Kubernetes of, of versions, right? Alpha, beta, uh, and then and V1. And you can read more about that um, in the URL. The last news, and we have not made big announcement about it. We did a blog post, a Twitter, um, but because we're not CNCF yet, but we did the first step. So Google um, was, uh, they own the trademark, the, uh, the, the project is open source, but they own the, the name, um, K Native, and we want to. They want to. We as a project, we wanted to donate it to to CNCF and be part of CNCF. So we did the first step of doing the application, looking for a sponsor. So we have a sponsor. We have an application. We open the PR, and we are um, we are um, submitting the proposal to be in incubation in in CNCF, and that's a big milestone. Um, now it's a uh, we're waiting to get the, into the agenda and the TOC uh, for the CNCF. To see what did they say, um, and if they accept, uh, we'll start the process. Um, me and steering, uh, and, and others are working on what will be the the steps of of moving everything into CNCF. And most likely, it's the the infrastructure, uh, the infra, and um, and those type of things. So, um, so that's a big big news idea for us. Stop that. Um, oh, case studies, um, a short, uh, short mention of this um, case studies. Uh, we did three case studies and that was kind of like our own rule that we put in. We don't want to go 1.0 if we don't have like official case studies from customers or uh, users um, of the pro open source project using it and then giving us uh, a code. So we do a, a very small interview and we capture that and it's in the website and you are watching this and you're using Knative, uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, or anyone in steering and we'll schedule a, a quick meeting with your company and, say, and ask you like how you're using Knative uh, and then we'll, we'll document your, your case study. So that also is a criteria in CNCF, right? To graduate, have, have folks using this in, in production beyond the vendors, right? So we want to have like people that don't have any stakes just using the software because they think they have they see um, quality in the software and we're using it. I think that's, that's it. Any questions so far? I see the chat uh, before we move on. 
No, I don't think we've got any for now, but uh, as Carlos was saying, feel free to jump in now if you have any questions or we do, as we said, we have the last 10 minutes after the talk for any questions. Okay. So um, let's, see, let's see some demos. Um, I, I think I heard there's some junior developers in here. So we'll have, uh, have some, uh, something to show that for everyone to, to enjoy. Um, so this is the website, Kennedy website. Uh, one of the recent things I would say in the last three months that we did with the, we ramped the website, uh, we're using MK Docs, uh, really material MK Docs. So if you're looking for an open source or um, yeah, or open source project that you want a documentation, um, MK Docs, material MK Docs is, is very useful, uh, at least for us, for technical writers to write in Markdown. So if you start, um, if you want to learn about the Knative, uh, we did this quick start of running Knative in your, in your, in your laptop, for example. Um, Knative used to have like a uh, big requirement, like you needed to install, like I mentioned, eventing and serving. And when the project started was only Istio. So um, I was um, kind of funny about seeing, I was hearing someone uh, the other day saying that first time they tried Knative in their, in their local computer, their computer stopped working um, because it was, um, it was Docker desktop plus Kubernetes plus serving plus eventing plus Istio and, and it was very massive. So uh, we have come a long, a long way on this and we no longer depend on Istio. You can use it if you're an Istio fan, but you can use something else um, as an ingress and uh, soon we'll be using the API gateway. So if you, you start here, you can use kind of mini cube. Um, the resources are very small, less than three CPUs uh, in your computer. And if you use kind, um, then you will need to have uh, Docker. If you use Minikube, you don't even have to have Docker desktop. I don't think I have Docker desktop running. Uh, we have a CLI in Knative that make it easy. It's like the same way as kubectl or kubectl to handle the, the YAML or the interfaces. So it's a quick way of uh, learning, for example. But when you go into production, usually you use something like, like GitOps um, or another tool, CICD tool. So if you install this, the CLI, it's called the KN. I don't know if you can see this. Um, install the KN CLI, and then there's a plugin called the Quick Start, um, and that will handle Kind or Minikube. So um, I don't know what software circles use for dev, dev environments. I know a lot of people use Kind if they're writing controllers, if they're writing like extending Kubernetes, and some other people that are like, that's that's not my use, right? I just want to like run my application that does machine learning. I don't. I don't care about CRDs or, or that 123 came out with schema validation and with using uh, cell. <laughs> um, and so I, I'm going to use Minikube. So let me copy this in my terminal. Let me open a new terminal here. Let me do a live demo and see how that looks. And so I have the KN CLI. Um, which I install, and then I have the, the, the plugin. So the plugin system is, works the same way as the kubectl plugin. Um, so you can put them in the path and then we'll find them. And then you, there's other, other, other plugins in the Knative CLI. So if you run this, let me check how many um, Minikube VMs I have. So I have one running that I'll do a demo I have the Docker one that I use for, for building images and then I'll create a new one. So if I run, that's not what I wanted to run. I want to run KN quick start. Can you see my, my screen or make it bigger? I don't know. Yes. Oh yeah, this is yes. awesome. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, run it Minikube. And we tried, we did some interviews for folks uh, that, um, not don't know Kubernetes, right? Um, and they just wanted to try the project and it was very, very difficult to figure out how to put things together. So this is something that we did in the, in the user experience of like, you know, I want to kick the tires and a lot of projects do this. They have an example, either with Kind or Minikube just to evaluate uh, the technology, learning the technology uh, locally or in a, on, a, on a, a small VM before they try it into their into the cluster. So, um, because sometimes either that developer uh, don't have access to install things in the 
the share cluster right or the dev cluster yet um and it could be a, a developer it could be an admin uh, me as an admin i like to see like i want to see like um if it, it the are back rules that's the first thing i want to see um well, what are what are the permissions that i'm giving to this controller and also um mutation webhooks um if or validation webhooks that are being installed globally in the cluster uh you can evaluate that but there's many ways to install Knative. Um, we have the the plain the plain YAMLs that you can you know keep to apply, or you can take that YAML and wrap it into a Helm shard. Uh, we also have a an operator, but it's an operator um, operator or controller installation. So you can create a custom resource called resource called serving, and it will install serving or or, or, or CR core called uh, eventing. And then it will start eventing and configure it. Um, in this case, um, since Kubernetes serving is based on on host name, you have to provide a host name um, traffic to get traffic from your laptop into the into Knative. So you need to open a, a second window. Uh, you open a second window around this Minikube tunnel that we put here, Minikube tunnel, and then. Uh, Minikube Knative, and this is what it's doing. Before we continue, so so Minikube tunnel is a an easy way to get like uh, ingress or host name into your your computer, and then press press enter, and now it's going to install um, serving and eventing, so you can just um, play around. So you install the, the CRDs, it would install, it will create a namespace called Knative Serving. Um, it will create a namespace called Knative um, Eventing and, and install the, the controllers on, on, on each one. And then it give you the, the, the CRDs that you're going to work with, which you can use with YAML or you can use with um, uh, the, the KN CLI or the kubectl uh, CLI. A cure, Courier is a the the API gateway interface or router that is comes from Knative, so that was replacing kind of Istio requirement. So you can use Courier, you can use Contour, or you can use Istio, and and that's required for like that traffic shifting uh, data plane. So that's that's the component that will take care of like uh, seeing the traffic coming in, see the host name, and then it knows which which serving uh, app needs to go to, but also like the traffic shifting that I was mentioning, um, if you want, and then the revision. So we have different revisions. So that's that's all it took to install um, Knative uh, to install to install the um, Knative. So in three minutes. So this is something I've also been working on, like um, making sure that is uh, that is super fast to. To install Knative and a reliable way, and, and you can run it. So once it's installed, let me make this a little bit bigger. Uh, you can run the CLI. You can do Knative service list uh, or, or Knative service dash h. And this is uh, we have many many options also. Like um, you just type kn. So you have the different the different commands um to create a service in, in terms of, of the serving not eventing but a a service is the top level resource and that will create the revisions so um i'll show an illustration in a, in a second but just to do a hello world um that i typically do is um can anyone tell me what is the web server you know most popular in all examples out there with kubernetes that people do with their with their hello world. Anyone? Is it Apache? Apache is one. What's <laughs> or is it one? Nginx? Nginx, OK. <laughs> so that's something that we didn't support. We didn't support K, uh, Nginx because Nginx needed, I think it was a um, slash logs or slash TMP or something like that. Anyway, we, we were not. And I was complaining, like, well, everybody does Nginx hello world. Well, how can we not? So um usually complain and we get it so 
<laughs> so if you do KN, let's create a service. So if you want to create a service uh, to have NGINX, um, right? You will have KN service service, uh, create, give it a name, NGINX, dash dash image, NGINX and port 80. Um, and this will um, create like all the magic that is kind of serving behind the scenes. Um, and I will show the YAML version in, in a second, but basically it's creating a service, a service abstraction is creating a route, it's creating a revision, 100% of the traffic goes to that revision v1 and also creates a host name. And if you have it configured with HTTPS uh, with less encrypt, I will get an HTTPS in this case, I have mini in my computer, so I don't have it configured. Um, and that's it. And then I can open, I can open this in the browser. Um, and Nginx is not working for some reason. Oh, it's um it's using example.com. So let's check um why it's not working. And I bet it's the the tunnel. We didn't pray to the demo gods. Yeah, it's it's the tunnel. Before before we that started. didn't work. So let me try another one in another cluster. So let's move to another cluster. This used to, this, this worked like this morning. Um, so if we, if you want to see um, what's happening, the, we have courier with this low balancer in this, um, IP address, but it's saying that it's, that it's pending. I bet that it could be the other, the other mini cube that I have running, but uh, the idea is that it's a low balancer and that should come back with an IP address. So let's see if we can do mini cube, mini cube stop the freezer. Um, and then we do mini cube uh, profile list, and we'll do mini cube tunnel or tunnel that, and that should conflicting route ten ninety six. So I'll, I'll try another one. So I'll try, let's try another cluster because I think I have like two mini queues with Knative and that's something that we haven't tested. Um, so let's uh, do kubectx and look for another cluster. So we'll move to OCP and we'll do the same. We'll do, I uh, do have an example here, service list. It's okay. So um, service, Service, service create nginx, and that let's see if that works. Um, always good to have a backup cluster. Okay, so that gave me back a URL. This one is HTTPS, and I open it, and then nginx is working. So that demo worked. But the interesting part um, out of the box with the K native is the scale to zero. So if we do a K get pods, um, there's a, a pod running. So after traffic stops going to that, to that service, the idea is that um, out of the box, that container will go, will go and be killed. So, um, and there's no magic to it. There's, uh, if you do get deployments, there's a deployment uh, there uh, for it. You can see it here. Let me delete this K and service. Delete func, func one. You can see it here. There's a deployment and, and you can configure like that window of like detecting that there's no traffic um, and it works on concurrency. So by default it's a hundred concurrent, uh, concurrent requests. Yeah, I think it's a hundred. I was thinking of 80, but I think another SAS provider does 80, but a hundred concurrent requests. So if there's a lot of traffic, more than a hundred uh, concurrent requests, a second pod will come up. Um, and then there's, if there's more, 
uh, requests coming in and each pod is kind of busy, you know, the third one will come up. And then when traffic stops to that container, for example, this NGINX uh, container, then the, the pod kind of will disappear. So if we do get pods or we do get deploy, now is is zero. So there's a deployment out there. And I wanted to show this because I know software circuits like works with Kubernetes every day, right? So it's, there's no point of like, like I do this, it's magic um, and there's something happening. Basically we are creating a, a deployment, but somebody is uh, uh, auto scaling that deployment and we're not using the HPA. We have an auto scaler that is getting metrics from a side container on that, on that pod. So if you notice is if we visit this website again, we should do, I mean, we should do catch, get pod and the pod comes up and it's running, right? So the, the, the service, your API, service API. And the thing is, this doesn't have to be an external route. This could be like service one calling service two, calling service three. It could be, you can configure it like, do not allow external traffic. The, the intention is to run, use the cluster local service uh, host name to talk, to talk to different services. So you can have like the service that is like critical to be up, like have one replica minimum, right? No scale to zero. And maybe the ones behind the scenes are scale to zero. That's kind of also a, a pattern for that. Um, and you can configure also Maybe I want to leave the cluster up, the, the pod up for when after there's no traffic, just leave it up for an hour, for example, or two hours, just in case there's some traffic and um, they don't they don't get that cold start. And I'll talk a little bit about, about the cold start. Um, so that's, um, and then that will scale to zero. So that's something that uh, we do with Knative. And then you can see here, there's, so that I start terminating. But I was going to point out that this one, this pod, it's on NG NGNX, but there's another container in there, a sidecar, and we call it the queue proxy. So that's the traffic goes into that queue proxy. And you set it, if you set that um, container to be only one concurrent request, um, it will only will do uh, one request at a time. And, there's software and there's there's uh, software and folks that are writing those type of application. They only want to, you know, handle one request at a time, and this is kind of the pattern for functions as a service. Things like Lambda or OpenWhisk, the the one that I that I co-created, um, that is functions as a service. Like you want that function to handle one request at a time, concurrency one, so you can set the concurrency. Um, and this is all YAML at the end of the day. I can also do KNN. Uh, KN service um, update. And I can set KN service and that concurrency, let me see if I can find it here, uh, is uh, you can set a, a target or you can set a, a limit. So you can set it, this is hard limit, you know, single replica. So I can update, I can update it saying update NGNX. Um, actually I have it here, handle one request. Um, so there'll be like queuing from the auto, the activator, that is a component that is sitting here catching the event when there's no pods and then, you know, starting that first pod. Uh, but every pod now will handle one request at a time. And the scale max to five is like, don't, don't create more than five requests, more than five uh, pods. Um, so it will start queuing. So if I update this, um, it will create a new revision. So this is the same way as deployments. When you update a deployment, you get a new revision and then traffic goes to that revision. So if we do KN um, revision LS, you can see here that I have two revisions. Is this big enough or make it bigger? It's this enough, is, I guess. Yeah, that, that's even better though. Thank you. So the default behavior, because I'm using the CLI, right? I don't have enough, all the control of the knobs, right? If I do it with YAML, it'll be, or I can do it also with the CLI show in a second. Um, I have NGNX, um, the last rev the revision, the, the, la the previous revision, which we call 001, you can give it a name. Um, now it's hundred percent to the new one. Um, and that one has concurrency equals uh, one. 
me see if that shows up in the describe. So some of these commands are also similar to the kubectl. Um, so you can describe the um, nginx. Let me see, nginx. And you can see here 100% to the, to the latest. Um, it doesn't provide all the information, but if I do KN, for example, I can do KGET, get service, NGNX, right? Um, this is a Kubernetes resource and you can get information, you can get hold the YAML. So let's um, watch the pod, um, it's already terminating. And if I visit it there and I do a couple of requests, um, um, and I'm not doing it fast enough, right? The, the containers will co start coming up, um, handling one request at a time. So it's doing the, the, the queuing. So if that queue is not like up, um, then we'll not do it. I can try to do, um, well, wait. Hey, right? Hey is a tool that you can, let me see if I can do, Scale to five, maybe not, because it's responding very fast. Um, so that is 50, it did 200 requests. Um, you can also scale with RPS. So um, that's that demo. Let me show you another one or show you a diagram. Um, so what about if, um, are people familiar with uh, Excalibur, the drawing tool, is it Excalibur? Scali draw, Scali draw. Cannot spell. Uh, uh, anyone familiar with this tool to draw yeah, yeah. circles? We create. And, yeah. yeah, we create horrible architectural diagrams there. <laughs> so, um, so I was using this to create kind of like talking points uh, with Knative, but it's in ScaliDraw.com. So, what about if I want to run my own version? Like this software is open source. To, the only thing that I would need from them is like a container. So I went to their GitHub repo and like, voila, I, I saw that they have a, a container. Um, so let's do uh, this exercise. So if I want to run that software with a typical Kubernetes, what it would take to run that? I would need to create our, our famous deployment, right? So. And here we'll go over and convert this into a Knative. So um, it's just 96 lines of code, very simple, right? Anyone, so Unity developer should, should know this. I'm being sarcastic. It's very complex. So let's start with this. Um, so we have our deployment that we create. Um, we can say like, I want one replica. Um, so if we start converting this, like let's say like, and then I have a service in here. Um, and the survey has the app selector that points to the deployment. And then you have the port 80 and then 80 again, and then 80 again. And 80. so it's a kind of madness, right? Sometimes. So what about if we take this and we call it just a service, right? And maybe this is a Knative service. So let me get this one because I don't want to make typos. Um, and let me see what else do I need here. Maybe I don't need this this label. Uh, for a deployment, it can have should have a name, and maybe this app that I'm going to run. I wanted to say the scale, the min scale, the max scale, like one pod and no more than one pod, like the replica one, right uh, here. So if I have this, then I can remove this. Um, a selector. Thing, and then like, why do I have selector, the match, right? That's the Kubernetes way of doing it. And then you have the template match. Like, I don't need this. So I can remove this and I, I don't need this. Um, I have the containers. I can name the container and not necessarily need to, to name the container because I don't think that's very useful. Um, ports, so ports um, in Knative, if it's not 8080, then you have to specify. So we'll leave it 80. Um, this lightness and readiness probe, so remember that we have the activator and we have this friend that is in the pod. So our friend, the queue proxy is the one that is going to watch if our container exits, it handles the sick term, it handles the liveness probe, if it exits with zero. So we don't have to specify 
this for this one, if it's going to be just checking sockets. And since we made our deployment a service, why do I need a service service? So this is our typical service that we do, right? And we just like kill that. We don't need that anymore. And then if we want to access this from our browser, we need an ingress, right? And usually you put an ingress and you put your TLS and certificates and give all that stuff. So I made the short one version here of like knowing the service that you want to go to, read, write this thing. So we can just like, I don't need that because Knative is going to handle this for me. Um, then we have the service mesh, Jolo service mesh that I found online um, that I can say the, you know, the new version is 90% and 10%. Um, Knative has traffic management. So that percentages of weight, uh, Knative, you can specify in Knative. Um, so we don't need to specify that because Knative is going to do that, that for us because you can configure at the service level. There's a traffic section that you can add and say which revision gets which ver how much traffic. Um, and then I need to create a certificate if I'm just insert manager. Knative also has integration for that. So when you create a new service, you can configure and say, hey, by the way, come create me a certificate if you have Y card or you have HTTP 01, create it for me so I can have a like a TLS termination. So we don't need this because Knative is going to do it. So um, I think that's it. We got it down to, to that. So that's kind of like when I'm talking about abstraction and developer experience is um, you can abstract this outside the container, like tools like Helm or CAP or JTT, uh, or you can like have that is abstractions inside the cluster with CRDs. So um, let me see if I made a mistake, right? Because this is a demo. So this is the after and this one. Um, maybe I this this. So let's see, let's score myself to see how I did it. Um, if I compare, if I can find the compare, right? The template and the metadata and the annotations. So actually I don't need, this can stay the same. You see what else did I, did I miss? The annotations, um, the annotation goes to, to the service, not to the, um, so the annotation should go to the service on their metadata. Not on the, not on the, on the bot spec. Um, what else do I have here? Um, since we don't have metadata, we have that data. And then that's it. So it was a uh, small thing to move the annotations. So, or I can just remove the annotations, right? This is just, if you want to configure things per service or non-globally, you can put usually, um, there's more annotations in there. Like if you don't want auto TLS in certain service, you can do it there. Also, you can put the concurrency, you can put it in YAML. So this is just to show that, um, the way we configure Knative in the YAML, if you're doing the YAML way, will be through annotations. On the bot, on the spec, is it follows the bot spec. And you can put everything in here, uh, but there's things that you sh we don't support on purpose out of, out of the box. And one example is a PVC. So that first question that people say, like, oh, I want to add a PVC. But remember that in Knative, we, we, we said that we wanted to scale stateless containers. Um, and if you can use an API to get to data or state, that's a better cloud native experience that rely on PVC, but take into account that it's some software requires PVC, but we want to scale rapidly up and we can scale down massively. So having a PVC that would like drop you back of like waiting for a PVC to be provisioned or attached or mount. Um, not saying that it's not possible, right? You can always, if I'm talking to folks here in server circles, you know what a mutation webhook is, right? So you can write a mutation webhook that takes the pod and it search your PVC and, and you know what you're doing. You're, you're adding that penalty yourself, if that makes sense. I mean, it could be software that actually, I was going, I was going to do an example because people are asking more for that, just to show like, yeah, you can, you can extend Kubernetes and when the pod gets created, because it's not created by, by Knative, it's created by the deployment, it's the, same, it's the same way of using something like 
um, kivernal, right? Um, or something that adds something to that pod as, as a policy. So enough talking like, does this thing works or not? So let's deploy this thing um, instead of the CLI using the kipctl. So kipctl apply, right? Everybody deploys like this in production, right, Sevi? Um, <laughs> yeah. and, and deploy it and I should have a version of this app um, So then this happens, yeah, in production. Who would spec deployment? I think I messed up something here. Annotations, metadata annotations. I have the right thing. So let's try this trick. If I want to get YAML, one thing that I can do is KN service uh, create excalibral. I cannot spell that thing, right? Port 80, um, port 80, and I can do dash dash target. I think it is. Um, and this will create me a, a, a YAML. So it looks like. Um, I was messing something up of the annotation. So, and if I do uh, mean scale and max scale, was it? Let's see. Mean scale one or scale mean. Scale mean one dash dash scale max one. For 80 target. Oh, I because need to it, it. because the, the service exists. It's size. Okay. Yeah. So okay. So it looks like the 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 good version of the YAML that I thought it was good is the bad. So the bad was actually the good. <laughs> So this is <laughs> this is basically the YAML. Let me, um, but this is an utility that we added to the Knative CLI. Uh, was another use case that I was so bumping into. Like, um, I'm good with the with this. I'm good with the CLI, and I don't like to write. I don't like to read reference documentation. I don't know if people like to do that on the nights, um, but. Um, basically, you can generate the YAML, the same thing as like kubectl, create something and then the output YAML. So um, it's, it was in the spec. So it needs to be in the spec. I, I, was, I was wrong. So this is basically how the YAML looks like. Uh, you have the name, you have your configuration on the, on the spec of, of that revision. And then this spec is the things that you put for the pod. So let's try that. Uh, before we run out of time. So uh, apply. So this is good, right? Because if everything goes well and nobody learns anything, how to do the debug stuff, um, just saying. Uh, default, and then I'll create my service. And then I can do KN service list, and that should give me my, my URL. Right, so is this one that I created five seconds ago, um, and now I have I have the app running on my um, diagrams up. Ooh. So questions. That looks beautiful. Yeah, thanks, um, Carlos. Uh, we do have two questions uh, by. Milo, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. I don't know if he wants to come in and ask. Yeah, that's question. fine. Yeah, cool. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a Dutch. It's Milo, but everybody. Well, uh, we have to talk a lot of English in the in the company, so everybody calls me Milo. I stopped correcting it. <laughs> uh, yeah, two questions. Uh, we have a, a lot of uh, clusters, and I like to uh, introduce K Native, but. Um, can I combine it? Because we don't have uh, Istio running because Istio is complicated and we have DevOps teams and yeah, it complicates things a lot. 
uh, can I enable HTL without uh, ruining uh, the setup? <laughs> Or should I actually create a different cluster, a dedicated cluster for Knative? Sorry, I mean, it's, I think you cut off. What's, what's the question? You have a lot of oh, clusters sorry. and something about yeah, and Yeah, we don't run Istio. Well, good. You don't have to. We don't because support. We don't, only we don't use Istio. For us. <laughs> you don't use. Oh, I thought you were. Oh, oh. so it's only the side spot that makes the, the decision. That's the proxy. No, no Istio. There's no Istio in this demo. There's no Istio needed. There's not going to be Istio required. Uh, uh, okay, great. Uh, okay, so it is the side pot that uh, arranges everything. I think I'm falling away. No, uh, is um, so basically. Let me show here if I have a. Um, I think this this is a good question. So you're asking. Um, so one question is, I have, I have clusters that I want to try, I want to try K native on, uh, should I create a separate cluster to try K native, uh, because of Istio and the, and the answer is you can use it on your own, um, clusters, um, and you don't, you, you don't require Istio, uh, but you require a K native, uh, network component and the options are Istio, uh, contour, or courier and courier is the k-native one that comes in the box and that would come into play if i do let me draw this so if deeply deeply what you have you have uh you have an ingress that that traffic goes into that ingress um today like you have your cluster and you have an ingress or a low balancer and the low balancer hits the service and the service hits the hits the is the a pod or deployment, right? That's the 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 network hubs. Um, yeah. So we K native. Um, it will look like this. Um, the traffic will come in, and instead of hitting your um, your ingress, it would hit, for example, our ingress um, core. It could be Istio contour. Or courier, but um, in my example here, and the one that is out of the box and it's very small, it's an envoy uh, one. Um, is is courier? I cannot spell. Um, then based on the host, uh, this courier is for all your services and all namespaces. So it says it's a single entry point into the cluster. So this is the load balancer that I was showing. I'll show in a minute. Um, so it will check the host um, to see if if which service. So Knative, the way it works, the serving is on the host name. So the host name will match to a service in a certain namespace. Um, so if you're talking to service to service, it will be service dot namespace. Anyway, it will go to this courier, and this courier is the one that is or could be Contour courier or Istio, uh, but you don't need Istio. It will do the host and also will do the traffic. Cannot write anymore. Um, I don't know why and I that, cannot. That courier then comes in place of Nginx in our case then. Uh, if you're using Nginx ingress controller, yes. Yeah. Um, Contour okay. will hit that. Then, then it will check the host. It will check the traffic, like which revision it is. And then it will send it to that pod. But if the, there's no pod, who's going to catch that request? That's what we call the activator. Um, and this is uh, here. So this is the, uh, the activator. This is when there's no, there's no pods. Um, traffic, when this is steady scale, it's called there. Uh, when there's uh, an activator, uh, it will go to that activator. So your ingress will go to the activator and the activator then will go until the auto skater bring the first pod, the second pod, and then the auto skater start seeing the traffic coming in, and then you get more pods. When traffic spot stops, then you are kind of in this mode. Activator is out of the picture, and you just going flowing from the the ingress um, to directly through uh, through the revisions. One thing that I want to say is there's a new thing called in, in Kubernetes called the API gateway. I, AKA Ingress V2, 
um, that ingress V2 or API gateway will have the traffic percentages, will have path base, but you know that ingress V1 today doesn't have traffic, traffic. the percentages. So API gateway will have the percentages and Knative then will create an API gateway resource and then it's up to who in the cluster admin install which ingress ingress type to implement the API gateway. So it could be Istio, Contour, NGNX, any of the, all of them that implement ingress v2 and say air quotes because they didn't call it ingress v2, it's called the API gateway in Kubernetes. Okay. okay. And then I can, yeah, and then I can combine the, the current deployments. So with the current static pods and I can combine that then with Knative. It doesn't bite each other. Yeah, to, to, like in this example, um, I'll give it one second. Yeah. Um, if you do get service all, um, I can have, I could have ingress NGNX and then my low balancer um, for courier or for Knative, right? Is, is which one, which low balancer do you want to go into? Yeah, that's um, yeah, so a good question. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Um, I know you have another question, but we're running a little bit short on time. So I will suggest you get in touch with uh, Carlos. Uh, he did yep. say he gave us his details and he did suggest he can, you know, hook him up and, and, and you go grab a virtual coffee together. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Carlos. Uh, really interesting. Um, I'm looking forward to playing around with um, uh, some uh, Knative stuff now. Uh, and yeah, thanks, thanks for yeah, no uh, for the uh, for me. presentation. Yeah, yeah, we we really enjoyed it. Cool. Um, Sevi knows you, and she will ask you a few questions <laughs> later, probably. Uh, okay, so um, off to our second talk by uh, Vuyo, uh, and Vuyo is going to talk to us about Terraform and how she's been learning about Terraform. So Vuyo is a junior cloud native engineer um, with Container Solutions. I have the pleasure to work with her every now and again. Um, uh, Vuyo, are you online? I think I'm frozen, no, I'm just kidding. I'm here. <laughs> um, thank you so much for the warm welcome. I'm excited to be here. Um, this is actually my second live demo. So I am a bit scared, but bear with me. Um, then share the slides. Okay, dogs. So I called this uh, Terraform part two. It was a terrifying experience for me to be learning a new language or a new framework to use um, when it comes to provisioning, right? But before we get into it, a bit about me. So my name is Voya, of course. I'm a junior cloud native engineer at Container Solutions, a Johannesburg co-organizer. So I organized meetups similar to this one's, but these ones are awesome, right? Because we're reaching more people. Um, I'm also a women tech maker. And one of my quotes is kind of like, the key is knowledge and that knowledge empowers you. Um, and that for me is sort of like a little motto that I live by. And then we've got a little bit of content that I'll be covering tonight. Mine, my talk or my session is going to be very short and brief. So <laughs> um, please bear with me as well when it comes to the demo. Pray, pray. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll have an overview about me describing um, Terraform and which commands I used a lot. Um, did I understand the assignment? I'm sure you're wondering about number three. I'll get back to that one. And then the topic, about the topic reflecting on what I learned. So did I understand the assignment speaks to me not wearing the correct dress code? So I didn't understand the assignment, right? Um, and then we've got introductions. So an introduction to Terraform. Terraform can be managed both you both using existing service providers and custom in-house solutions, building a resource graph and creates or modifies non-dependent non-dependent resource parallel. So for me, that was so confusing when I went through the documentation. And so what I did is I just need to move us. <laughs> okay. So in layman's term, code that is used to provision infrastructure. That is what the introduction was saying. And it was confusing. Okay. Sorry. And I'm referring to this part. 
Okay, and so number two, the features, which commands I used a lot. So the prehistoric Terra playing on dinosaurs because my son loves dinosaurs. Um, so Terraform in its Terraform format, Terraform plan, Terraform apply. And so what happens is with Terraform in it initializes and downloads the prerequisite providers that you'll utilize when you're running Terraform scripts. Um, Terraform format helps you reformat whatever um, is happening in your config. So it helps you keep to the standard that they have. Terraform plan, it basically tries to get you to your desired state. Terraform apply is where the magic happens. And so what I find, what I found is, um, so in this part of my cloud journey is that I've, I've had a lot of input when it comes to the Nigerian developers assisting me in my learning. Um, a lot of people that I surround myself with within the company have been super helpful with internal projects that I'm working on. And so I'd like to get more of these awesome tools that we're using or open source projects to other people, right? Uh, very big on growing communities. This number has increased. So now we've got an adoption of 1,505 companies and more that are using Terraform within their tech stack. And then the problem versus the solution. I had to learn this because of an open source community project that we're working on at work. Tomas can attest. Uh, so we're working on the Terraform examples. And the solution was that despite not knowing what I was doing, uh, I had support around me as mentioned prior. I also have Twitter, um, post a lot of questions if I'm stuck on anything and Googling is like my bestie. And then we have step one, step two, step three and four, where I prefer to research than ask a lot of questions, break things and try to build. And then going back to the commands, so these are yet again the commands that I would be running throughout the session, Terraform init and format and plan, where we have to also validate some a few things. We've got workspaces, we've got versions that we're utilizing. And now it's demo time. I hope you guys have been praying for me throughout me talking. Um, okay, so just get to the okay now i've got it i've got it <laughs> i just need to move us sorry um to the side and there we go so what we'll be doing today is we'll be trying to so we'll be trying to now um deploy a sql instance using gcp um this is part of the terraform examples and then we'll also be playing around as it's being deploying, as it's deploying something in the CS. So that's the cloud um, storage bucket. Um, okay, that's I feel like I'm a little bit nervous, but we'll, we'll get through it, right? Um, Tomas, do not stress. I have made a copy of this and played around with a few things. Um, okay, so what you'll find in here is there's a structure that we follow at CS. Um, especially when it comes to open source projects, you want to be as resourceful and helpful to other people as possible. Um, you will require to have a provider. Um, so this is the one that we have throughout a lot of the Terraform documentation. There is a variable ID. So usually what happens is it's either cleared out or I made mistakes and we troubleshoot together. We and then only oh, seeing the Google Cloud Platform <gasps> screen oh <laughs> sorry, sorry okay thank you <laughs> okay let's try again and i think you should see the whole screen now are we good yeah we're good okay. Thanks. awesome so these are just some of the projects that are working under google so i'm a little bit of a gcp evangelist um and these are some of the things that people at cs have contributed towards to mars can attest now <laughs> To what he sees. Um, so over here we've got um, the provider, the documentation is linked above just to make it easy for people to utilize. We've got the variable project ID and then we've got the where the magic happens. So that's the storage bucket and it can get very granular real quick. So depending on how you want your storage um, to be done or provisions to people who will be utilizing your tool, whether it's cold storage, regional, um, and so forth. And then you can get in detail using Terraform. 
So what's going to happen is we're going to run Terraform in it, and then we're going to get a bunch of errors, but not with Terraform in it. And then we're going to troubleshoot them together because we're still scared, right? <laughs> OK, so oh, mm, fun times. I'm in the wrong place. OK. OK. okay. Bigger in the jiffy. And we've got more stuff in there. Okay. This one. And equal to that piece. There we go. Okay. So I hope you guys can see that. I was actually explaining a different one, but the concept is very similar. Um, yeah, so the SQL. A database instance, but when it comes to just provisioning, not what the what the resource does. Um, okay, so what you'd see here is we've got something where it's explaining which version you're using, which region. So we have various regions that are there. We've got the EU, the US, and more. We've got different tiers. Micro would be the smallest, and depending on the size of the of the organization, uh, how much. Um, how much of the tier uh, storage you, you require, that is what you'll utilize. Um, so over here, what we usually do is we would say something like change me, and then this would help whoever is using the open source uh, project or resource to make it easier for them to navigate. Um, OK, so let's just try again. <laughs> and let's just move this up a little. Okay. Okay, so now we'll be running Terraform in it. So this say it again initializes. And if we try to run other things, let's find out. Before we plan, we format. So the format is fine, but had I done something like, for example, Okay, that and okay, region stays the way it is. And then we just save that. If my formatting wasn't correct, it would definitely help us to stay out. <laughs> okay, so what it's done is it's fixed that for me. It's no longer not aligned properly. So this is referring to the syntax that it requires. And then we've got Terraform plan, which is sort of the desired state. And then it's going to ask you your uh, project ID. And I do have my project ID. So now over here, copy that. Ooh, sometimes. Okay. So instead of using GCP console, okay, fine. So now we try to use the project ID that we already have. Um, and then we see we've got a bit of an error, right? So now what is it complaining about? It's complaining about a managed resource, Google SQL database instance has not been declared over here. Okay. I'll just need to fix that to make sure that it's the same, right? So that was intentional just to make sure. And let's try again. Are we getting to the desired state or not? And the nice thing about, okay, the nice thing about what I found with Terraform is that how easy it is to actually adopt it as a tool as well. Um, and then we can see that whatever changes we've made and the state we're in, and then if we come here, it's telling us that something happened over there. Okay, so we can actually, and okay. So usually what it takes, it takes about 10 minutes. And I thought within that 10 minutes, while it's still busy creating things, okay, we're in different places now. Okay. You need to be with me a little bit longer. Um okay. okay. And Tomas, if you ever want to chime in, please do so. Okay. And should be able to. Okay, 
cannot. Just wanted to that. ask, uh, did you run both yeah. plan and apply or? Yes. Oh, thank you. Did you see that? Oh my gosh, thank you so much to us. How helpful are my colleagues? Okay, so in my head, I ran Terraform Apply, but it was running in my head. I'm like, why am I not seeing the resource being created, right? And so, but luckily there's English, right? And this is how <laughs> wonderful this tool is. And it's told me in white text that I should run Terraform Apply and I didn't. Um, but that's the nice thing about having people who are available. <laughs> so thanks for that. Okay. Okay, and then you would have to select yes. And then now it will be, ah, there we go. So error failed to create instance, error invalid request instance. Dot, okay, there we go. So it has to do with the naming convention. So I hope you guys remembered that I spoke about the names that we'll be utilizing will not be the same. So we've got the, the, the name over here that's being referenced and then it hasn't been changed accordingly. Okay, so like that. And if I'm making more mistakes to us, do chime in again. Uh, one thing that I also read in the documentation that the deletion protection should be set to false. And let's look some more. Okay. And okay. Okay, let's find out. And resource master line three four. Yes, case. Um, I feel like I'm still gonna get an error. Okay, but let's try. Tomas, come through. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I would suspect that quite often those names can't have underscores. So maybe it could be about that. Yeah, that's the that's the hard. Uh, required from uh, Google. Uh, okay. So you change the underscores with, or just call it instance. Mm -hmm. Instant okay. instance, please. <laughs> instant <Yeah>. instance. <laughs> okay. Yeah, letters and hyphens should be good, but not underscores. Okay. Let's try it again. Fingers crossed. Because now if I get it wrong, then it's your fault. <laughs> okay. And so usually it takes about like 10 minutes to create. So what we'll be trying out is also just uh, let's do this. Create a new window over here. I'll just increase that font. And okay, so fresh. I don't know if it's the connection in South Africa, but yes, it's really fun. Um, so over here it's doing something. Okay, let's see. There was movement as well earlier today, but it usually takes about like 10 minutes, no lie. Um, so as we wait for the fun times to come through, what we'll be doing is we'll be using Tomas again, but not just yet. Um, okay, hopefully you guys can see my screen fine. And we are just gonna make a directory and call it, um, times. 
<laughs> okay, and then we'll just go into that directory and create main.tf. Okay, so probably shouldn't try it that way. Let's just go with VS Code. It's more convenient as well. Okay. So we'll find that we've got a little, hmm, didn't create that file. Okay, but it's fine. Probably didn't save it properly, but let's do it again. So what I learned to do a lot throughout the time spent is Googling. Um, so you'll see that we have, well, Terraform has quite a few providers and GitHub being one of them. And then all you just have to do is literally copy and paste. Okay, I'll close one of the tabs because I'm, I'm, I'm infamously known for having a million tabs running at the same time. Um, and then what we want to try to do is to not only read about the resources as we wait, um, we can collaborate with various people or with a team or become a member. But in this case, we just want to create a repository and collaborate with someone. And so what you would do is, uh, see, it's still creating, 10 minutes. <laughs> um, so then what you would try to do again now is just blob that in there, but before doing so, what's really cool is you just wanna have, uh, you, you wanna generate an access key so you can just go to your GitHub repository and then you should come through to developer settings and the personal access token, generate a new token. Password. If I don't, it's one password. There we go. Okay. Seven days. I haven't read enough about what I'm agreeing to. So I could be signing my soul away, but it's all good. Um, so usually I just accept all of this for now until I read more about it, right? And then we'll get an access token. It'll be copying and utilizing. So now what we wanna do is you could either go through the documentation again, or just find the provider. And then we know that we're using GitHub. Okay, and yeah, don't we just love when it auto completes for us? Okay, clearly it doesn't want to. There we go. And then what we would just do is plug in the access token. There's obviously a much more secure way of doing this because you wouldn't want to publish this um, and then other people be accessing it for security reasons. And okay, so we've got that with white space. And then repository. Got an example of software service and my awesome second live my demo um, and then we'll just give it a name. Okay definitely feeling some terror. And then what you would just do is you could leave that there, but if you won't be using this, I'd probably just remove it. Um, and then I think somebody's missing a bracket somewhere. You've got one extra curly bracket. There you go. Okay. Then you need to delete it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And then, so what we have done is we've added a provider. We've got a token. We're now, we've just added our repo. And then we want to collaborate with someone like Tomas. And he's pretty cool because he's very helpful, right? Um, and it's still going. So we've got four minutes. <laughs> so what we'll do over here is go back to the documentation. And then we've got the repository collaborator. And you can, I saw there's like quite a few things that you could utilize. You can use a user invitation acceptor, 
and so much more, right? But in this case, we'll just copy and paste, but understanding what is required as well. So we've got our GitHub repository. Um, okay, so this would probably be the name of the repository and on top there. Okay, we'll get there. So the name is Terra and the username, Tomas. That is the I, I believe I wrote it down. And is this correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay, I'm not sure about making your permissions admin, but for now, uh, I think we're good to go. So we put collaborator. I think I'll just leave that there for now. Okay, so then let's just open up the terminal. And okay, um, we'd probably want to connect to, okay, we'll get there. <laughs> okay, so we'll just run Terraform in it. And if somebody just wants to chime in, come through. <laughs> um, yeah. So we'll be just initializing again. Terraform format. I think most of it is fine. Okay, it fixed the main. Thank you. You ran it. And it creates some TF states files that we could utilize. We're using that in DCP for a pipeline that we're creating. Um, they're, they're on Terraform apply. Today we're reading the English. And if it says yes. And luckily with the token, it'll know where I'm at. And then we'll be able to see what is happening in the repositories. And if Tomas can check his, he'll be able to validate that he has also been added as a collaborator. So you guys can see that there. We added Terra. There's nothing happening in there just yet. But then I think it's a pretty cool tool to use um, and play around with. There's more that it does, but it was also a little cool time waster as we're waiting for this instance to be deployed on GCP. As we wait for the um, database to get deployed, you're talking about mm -hmm. Terraform examples. Yes. Do you want to go a little bit more into that? Because this is not official Terra uh, HashiCorp stuff, right? No. <laughs> that no. was Terraform example. Sorry? Uh, so what is Terraform examples? So Terraform examples is literally the examples that we're creating for people to utilize. So if you, for example, love GCP, uh, as I do, so then we're just helping people use Terraform examples to provision things using GCP. Um, there's quite a lot. Um, there's others that haven't yet been filled out. There's quite a few that's been done. It gets very granular really quick, but we're keeping it very simple for people to get started with using Terraform with the Terraform examples. So that's what we're doing. And then there's for AWS, and I believe there's another team for Azure. Um, but yeah, that's what we're doing in our spare time. I feel like you have more questions, Tim. <laughs> um, well, yeah, so I'm a big fan of Terraform. And, uh, and I probably shouldn't have done this talk. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I love seeing other people use it and, and, and getting to learn more about it. So uh, I think what was one, one, one question I would have would be, what is one thing that really annoyed you <laughs> when, when learning Terraform? Um, that the documentation is not clear enough. So right now um, we're actually trying to do something with Slack. There's no Slack provider to create a user and invite them, like just creating that token, like in that in that manner. So just creating that invite. So that's like been a problematic little thing or so enough. Like we have to use other resources. So the resources aren't enough just yet. Um, the documentation, but I think the adoption, it's 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 not that bad. But the only thing is just being a part of adding uh, resources and providers so people can utilize them with its modules and so forth. So just the documentation. 
Are you taking notes? Because <laughs> I wasn't sure. No, no, I was uh, going to post the link to um, uh, Terraform examples in our chat. So anybody ah, who's interested, love it. Uh, yes. can look at that. Um, yeah. I have a question. You for you. Yeah. Um, uh, what would you recommend to the new starters uh, of Terraform as you have passed this path yourself? Or, you know, I, with CS. I'm still passing it, hey? <laughs> I'm still walking that path. Um, but I would definitely suggest reading documentation, um, even though it gets a bit hectic. I think um, for some people, it's a language barrier as well. Um, watch videos, reach out to people. Like I was struggling with um, some of the stuff that we're doing at, at, um, at work. And then I just reached out on Slack and the Slack channels on Twitter. And people are more than happy to help, especially if they're experts in their field. Um, yeah, so I think just asking for help when you're stuck, even if you think it's a silly question, just go for it. Because uh, that's what I do. Like even during this session, I asked for help. <laughs> and it's it's nice to have experts in the field. Yeah, that was and, great. And when you play around with the tool more and more, you get a bit more comfortable. So this is like, yeah. It, I, I would definitely suggest that and read read my blog too because <laughs> I wrote about just learning about it with the first part and then we'll carry on writing and documenting our journey with Terraform but so far we like it thank you and I, I know there's also Pulumi as well so y'all can check that out but we're kind of hooked on Terraform for now <laughs> yeah so this takes quite a minute eh so it's created the database. It's now mm -hmm. creating, or it created the database instance. It's now it's, creating yeah. the database. There we go. So it took line. two minutes. Yeah, it took two minutes extra, right? Um, but yeah, so let's just check out the activity. Okay, so just want to run Terraform destroy just to make sure we kill it and we don't waste people's precious money. But luckily, there are tools in uh, GCP that you can utilize to care, like to curb the billing um, when you get alerts for people who are going over budget. And if you ever do, you can reach out to support. They're super helpful. Um, yeah, but they'll just tell you don't do it again. <laughs> um, okay, so we can see we've created the instance. And we've provisioned it using Terraform. So if we look at the granular, the granular detail of the resource, it's still loading up some stuff. Um, but this looks like it's stuff from before as well. So, but what you'll see is that it, you'll have whatever you specify when it comes to the um, the CPU or the tier that you're utilizing, or if there's any granular detail that you want to provision a bit more when it comes to using GCP, you can do that using Terraform provided the documentation from HashiCorp is good. <laughs> uh, but other than that, you can break things and learn. And uh, let's see, I wonder, I wonder. Tell me if this is going to work or not. I don't know if it was a typo the last time. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, aha, uh -huh. dude, <laughs> look at me, look at me going to other places. But anyway, permissions denied, we think of that. Okay, so let's just try it again. I can't spell, sorry. Terraform this the boy. Okay. And I believe my ID A2 and nope. Yeah. My ID. And it takes a bit of time. One thing you do not want to do is kill it like before it actually kills it properly. So you don't want to just hit a control C. Um, don't do that, especially when you're here. Let it destroy and finish, otherwise it's going to take even longer. Um, but let's go back to my slides. 
<laughs> last but not least thank you thank you for bearing with me and joining me on my terrifying journey i feel like these demos keep on getting more and more terrifying uh, but yeah i would really highly recommend reading the documentation reaching out to people on twitter they are super helpful um, but this is just a little that I've learned when it comes to using Terraform. And it was literally the first time using it last month. So, <laughs> um, yeah, and that's about it. Woo! Thanks, Buyo. Um, I, I love that you just went for it and, 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 and you just started learning a month ago and you're already presenting about Terraform. Uh, I think that's awesome. Well done. Uh, really, really. I'm proud of you. Um, really like the demo. And as you saw with Carlos, you know, the demo gods uh, or dino <laughs> gods do get involved every now and again. So don't worry about that. Uh, everybody gets stuck in that in a place. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, I see that. <laughs> so, uh, Sevi asked, do you, Sevi, would you like to go? Yeah, I was wondering how um who you felt when she was learning like what was the scariest part of terror forms for you i think it was just so the first person to explain what terraform looks like was christian uh, so one of the colleagues and he was busy with like networking and it was looking very scary at that point um but other than that i think it was just it was intimidating because it's learning a new a new tool, right, to use a new tool. Um, I'd never worked with infrastructure as code. And so it was like the first time working with it. So that was the scary part, um, learning that uh, and how to use it, right? So, and, and especially there's a bunch of people. <laughs> yeah. Mine was leaving the, you know, resources here and there, and then <laughs> the bill and bills come at the end of the month. And I have no idea what's going on. Yeah, no. I think for me, it's it's a very nice and a very good experience to have people that are senior as you're learning, because then they you pick up from whatever mistakes they've made. Um, but when it comes to billing, I made sure <laughs> that you, you you curb it right, and then you destroy whatever you've created. Um, yeah. And then yeah, I think I think, yeah. I think that's a definite uh, good suggestion there make sure you destroy anything you don't need <laughs> right. we've seen some horror stories online where uh, the bill just keeps on going up 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 and up uh cool carlos did ask us uh, where uh, container solutions or any other company would would store their tf state usually um, yes mm -hmm. yeah no yeah. so it's usually in a cloud storage bucket um so there's quite a few um, that's where we're currently storing whatever we're creating with um, utilizing Concourse. So I would guess with AWS, it would be an S3 bucket. Um, with Azure, I'm not 100% sure about the naming convention, but then they do have um, places where you can put um, that. Um, I would also suggest to always back up your backups and test if your backups work. Um, yeah, then that's, that's what we do. Is it terrifying when you 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 lose your TFT file? <laughs> it depends what's on it, right? So I think it it definitely wouldn't be like a good a good space to be in if, for example, it's it's got a whole bunch of things that we're utilizing and poof, it's gone and yeah, people can't access things, depending on how you're utilizing it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you can. It's a it's 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 challenging to recreate the TF state file if, if you do lose it because you can't mm -hmm. import stuff into a TF state file, mm -hmm. but it's a big job. <laughs> so yeah, as as Buyo said, and I really like that he did say it. Make sure that your backups are working, uh, and do backup and make sure that they are working. Cool. Um, awesome. One suggestion, Buyo. Delete the uh, GitHub uh, API. No, I will. I will. I always do. I do. We're, we're recording this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I always do, definitely, because um, there's also better ways of how how it could be done, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, but I, but I obviously, would... for the demo gods, you had to you had to do uh, <laughs> you had to you had to provide some kind of sacrifices as an yeah, API. Now, 
Yeah, now with the new GitHub OIDC authentication, I'm, my guess is well, you don't need like a static API key, right? You can configure the, the temporary OIDC yes. authentication with GitHub. Yeah, so I actually posted something on Twitter and one of the guys at Hashiku said to remove it. I'm like, no, 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 it's not a valid key. <laughs> so um, yeah, no, um, they're very, very helpful and they do show you what is best practice. But this, for these purposes, it was just to showcase creating a repo, adding a collaborator, using Terraform and how easy it is. So anybody can do it if I can do it. <laughs> I know you put just no 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 you're learning a lot. I love, I'm, I'm loving your le your learning journey at Container Solutions, uh, and you're doing great. Um, and I'm I did love the slides. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Good. Thank cool. You. All right. Um, thanks again, Vuyo. Thanks again, Carlos, for uh, joining us sure. and giving us some great information. Um, yeah, we hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, and you do have a good Christmas and New Year. And we'll see you next year. I'm going to get drunk on some glue vine. <laughs> <laughs> see you, everybody. Thanks a lot for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.